Thanks, Rich. Uh, I'm sorry we had to rush through happies, but uh, we have an extraordinary speaker today, and, and, and we really still don't have uh, a very fortunate. I think have. I might got kicked off. Uh, is it? Do you see Sean Sage is a PhD at the University of Central Florida. That's why we have a lot of read the longer because, intro uh, okay. than normal because you really need to understand how know. fortunate we are to have the speaker with us today. So. Anyway, John, uh, Dr. Uh, Snaith is uh, director of the University of Central Florida Institute of Economic Forecasting and is nationally, he's a nationally recognized economist in the field of business and economic forecasting. He's a recipient of multiple awards for the accuracy of his forecast, his research, and his teachings. He has served as a consultant with local governments, multinational corporations such as Compaq, Dell, IBM, uh, before coming to UCF College of Business, he held teaching positions at Penn State, American University in Cairo, University of North Dakota, University of the Pacific. He's been quoted, this will drive home the point. He's been quoted in the Wall Street Journal, USA Today, New York Times, The Economist, The Guardian. He's appeared on CNBC, Fox Business, The Nightly News with Brian Williams, Al Jazeera, BBC, CBC, China, Central Television, Nippon TV, Business Newsweek, et cetera. Uh, he's a member of several economic uh, organizations and national economy, economic forecasting panels, including the Wall Street Journal's Economic Forecasting Survey, the Associated Press Economy Survey, uh, CNN uh, Money.com. Uh, the list goes on. So hopefully you can appreciate uh, our good friend to have uh, this speaker today. Please welcome Dr. Sean Snedden. Thank you, nice to be here. I was a little bit nervous when I saw the venue uh, for today's meeting. I didn't know if somehow the Rotary had morphed into some sort of biking gang or something. Yeah, I was like, yeah, am I going to earn my cut when I'm here today? I mean, do I have to whack somebody out back? I didn't know. I thought maybe something bad would happen during the pandemic to the organization. So I'm glad it's still <clears throat> benevolent. Um, well, I'm going to limit my remarks because I'm sure there's uh, more questions that I'm going to be able to address in, in a short uh, amount of time. And I'd like to be able to answer as many of them as I can. Uh, I used to talk about the 2008-2009 recession, which has come to be known as the Great Recession, um, as the recession of a lifetime. I guess I underestimated my life expectancy because uh, the 2020 recession uh, was actually more severe uh, than that 2008-2009 recession. The, the depth with which uh, output fell during the short recession the number of jobs that were lost during that short recession and the rate at which unemployment peaked uh, all exceeded that which we experienced during the 2008-2009 uh, recession. Uh, so it was historic in that way. It was historic in some other ways as well. It's also the shortest recession in US economic history. It lasted just two months. Um, and it is, I think, the first uh, recession that was fully uh, or 90% or at least, self-inflicted. Uh, the reason we had that recession was simply the policy response to COVID-19. Uh, and all the problems that we're seeing today that are headlines in the economy, the supply chain, inflation, labor market shortages, all can be tied back to policies that were implemented as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, and so, you know, I, I, back in March 2020, I was sort of watching this unfold and uh, I was reminded a little bit of the uh, medieval times when the Black Plague was uh, sort of ravaging Europe. And uh, a lot of people believed that at the time that this was punishment from God. And so in order to try to avoid getting the plague and show God that you were sorry, you know, a lot of people took to the streets and were you know, flagellating themselves. And so, you know, I think there's a saying, right, that history doesn't repeat itself, but it rhymes. Uh, when we started shutting down parts of the economy, I thought, well, this is kind of like an economic flagellation that we're doing to ourselves. I'm not so sure how this is going to mitigate the spread of, of, uh, of a virus. 
And I'm not sure that it did at all, quite frankly. But yet some countries are still sort of doubling down on the same policy that didn't prove terribly effective the first time. Around. So when we shut down the economy and the government decides, oh, your business is not essential. Probably not to you um, <laughs> or your family or your employees, but in the eyes of uh, the brother, it was not essential. You shut down. You keep going. That's okay. Uh, as soon as you say that, the doors are closed. Uh, there's no more goods being produced. There's no more services being rendered. Uh, and the output for these closed businesses goes to zero immediately. Uh, there's no need to have employees if your doors are locked. So all your employees are fired. Uh, and so we saw a spike in unemployment that looked nothing like anything we've seen historically. Typically, the labor market is lagging behind the overall economy. So when the economy starts to slow, the first reaction of businesses are, to, oh, we've got to lay some people off. Like, well, let's wait and see if this is a bad quarter, a bump in the road, let's see what happens next quarter. Uh -oh. Three quarters, well, maybe we have to make some tough decisions. There was no uncertainty there. You have to close your business. Okay, well, I don't have business, I don't need employees. So in a matter of seven or eight weeks, we saw some 35 million people lose their jobs. Uh, the unemployment rate shot up uh, to, to uh, close to 14%, again, in a matter of weeks. And the economy plunged instantaneously, really, into recession. And so the Bureau of Economic, uh, National Bureau of Economic Research uh, is a think tank in Massachusetts uh, who declares or who puts dates on the business cycle. So you know, the business cycle, you might remember, is just the fluctuation in output in the economy that occurs over time and all economies, both agrarian to the most industrialized. So you reach a point, you go into a recession, you reach a trough, you begin the next recovery. And so this uh, MBER puts dates on these turning points. Here's when the peak of the cycle started, which means this is when the recession began. Here's when the trough of this cycle started, this means where the recession ended. And typically, it takes them about 18 months before they declare the start of a recession, 18 months after it's already began. Now, you know, insert your you know, economist jokes here. Um, but the reason they do this is they want to wait for the final data. Because a lot of economic data that you see, the jobs numbers, even GDP reports, are preliminary in nature. And then over time, they get revised. So they want to assign a date based on final data. So that's part of the reason for the lag. This time around, they were able to date the start of the recession within two months of the beginning. Because there was no there was no uncertainty whatsoever about when this thing began. It began when the lockdown. And so when did the recession end? Surprise, surprise. It ended two months later when the lockdowns by and large were lifted and malls could open back up and, and restaurants, at least in some places, and, and people were able to start going back to work. So we've been in a recovery from this COVID-19 policy recession uh, since that point, since, uh, since June of, of 2020. And I think we're gonna continue uh, in that uh, recovery, at least through uh, the first half of this year, because what's driving this recovery, and you may be seeing it uh, in, in your individual businesses, uh, is consumer spending. You know, uh, Every recession, we have something that's called pent up demand that occurs. So during a recession, even people that are financially unimpacted by the recession uh, tend to pull back on their spending, right? Their income might not have changed, uh, their wealth might not have been affected, but they don't spend the same way that they would in a recession in times of non-recession. And so when that recession ends and the uncertainty starts to clear and people start to feel better uh, about their, their financial and economic outlook, uh, then that pent up demand gets released. So during a recession, you maybe you hold off, you don't get the new car. You don't take the trip to the Bahamas. You don't redo the bathroom. You wait and see how this thing's going to play itself out. Once things stabilize, that pent up demand is, is unleashed. And that's usually part of the fuel that leads the economy out of uh, the recession and in the early phases of the recovery. This time around, I, I called it pent up demand squared. And we've had, we had traditional pent up demand. Uh, and it was a lot because the recession was severe. But I call it pent up demand square because not only do we have traditional pent up demand, we were literally pent up uh, with people we formerly referred to as our loved ones. And when those <laughs> quarantines uh, were, were restricted, 
people wanted to go and they started to go. Uh, and we saw that uh, in 2020 during the holiday uh, travel season, uh, the Orlando airport had the highest passenger throughput of any airport in the country. So people were like, okay, we know more about the pandemic. We know about the virus, we know who's at risk, we know who's at lower risk. We're going, we're traveling. And so this pent up demand squared is still being unleashed as we speak. I think it will continue through the set, first half of this year. And this compounded pent up demand uh, has run into uh, a supply chain and over the decades has become uh, more oriented to just in time provision of goods. You know, when I started in the economics racket, inventories were a real important determinant and predictor of the business cycle because businesses would build product and, and store it in, in warehouses. So they have it there. But you know, when you build a product, you, you make lumber, you make uh, chips, but you don't sell them, you're incurring all the costs of production, but you're getting no revenue. So that doesn't help you with profitability during the, the year which you produce them. So technology allowed businesses to move towards this just-in-time supply chain. And that's fine, it works, except in this situation where you had just this massive wave of demand that was unleashed, that ran into this just-in-time supply chain that was already hampered by the lockdowns and the shutdowns of some areas of manufacturing. So, you know, here comes all this demand. Oh, we got to fire back up the plants. We got to start producing. Uh, and now we're seeing sort of the logistics phase of that supply chain running into problems with cargo ships lined up uh, you know, 40, 80 deep uh, off the West Coast, problems getting goods to uh, distribution centers and from distribution centers to the shelves. So you start to see. It's not like during COVID-19, you, you knew there wasn't going to be toilet paper. That shelf is always going to be, right? Now, this is not clear what shelf is going to be on. It sort of depends on which, you know, uh, containers get unloaded. Uh, so you just have these random empty shelves now uh, throughout the economy. And, and so this problem is going to continue. Uh, it's, it's not a situation that, okay, the supply chain is going to catch up, everything's okay, because this demand has kept coming. And it has been fueled again by policy, right? $1,400 check for you, you get a $1,400 check. Everybody gets one, right? It's like uh, Oprah's Christmas show, if you ever watch that. Um, and that money kept coming. Here's an extra $300 in unemployment insurance. So trillions of dollars you know, have been pushed into the economy through the CARES Act and subsequent legislation. And this has provided you know, fuel to this ongoing fire of consumer demand. So the supply chain wasn't like, oh, here's a burst of demand, now we can find work, work, work to catch up. That demand kept coming, kept coming. And so I think we're gonna see these supply chain issues through the end of 2022, possibly into uh, 2023. But I think this, by and large, the pent up demand that is you know, driving a lot of these issues will start to abate in the second half of the year and we'll get back to something a little more normal. Um, so inflation, again, same situation. You, know, you don't have goods. You've got a lot of people that want to buy them. Uh, too many dollars chasing too few goods is one way we explain inflation in introductory economics classes. And so, you know, the federal government and all the spending just kept pushing more dollars into the economy, chasing after fewer and fewer goods. So now we see these price hikes that have affected uh, I think the thing that bothers me the most, I think, is, is chicken wings. I don't know why. I, <laughs> you know, two by fours, whatever, you know, the chicken wings. <laughs> like two bucks a piece. It used to be like a nickel, you know? Which in 1952, I think the uh, happy dollars were happy nickels. Uh, I don't know what I'm The wings were just like, you know, just remember, you know, two bucks, you could eat, you know, it was like a feast of wings. Now let's just get you a single wing. But anyway, um, so you're seeing all these high prices. And uh, again, is this a transitory thing? I think there was some hope at the beginning that that might be the case. But the problem is, uh, in my mind, is now we're seeing a link and a feedback between wages and prices. And we haven't seen that kind of feedback cycle since the 1970s, uh, which we call a wage price spiral. And so, you know, the longer it sticks around and, you know, workers, you know, are asking for higher cost of living adjustments, that means more money in the paycheck that's getting spent and you sort of get this 
spiral that supports higher inflation. And then the psychology of it is the other piece. I mean, the Fed has been trying for you know a decade to try to get inflation to their target of 2% with no success. Um, but now I think the psychology, if that starts to turn, uh, the roots of inflation get a little bit deeper. Uh, so I think the Fed is going to have to act uh, more quickly than most people were expecting as we go through 2022, because you don't want those roots to get real deep. Because we saw that in the early 80s, uh, the pain that we had to self-inflict, the great high inflation from the, from the 70s, uh, which was a, a severe recession. And at the time, the worst recession since the Great Depression. Um, that's a record we keep breaking, and I'm not you know, really thrilled about that. But uh, you don't want those roots to get too deep, because then extracting and, and calm inflation down becomes a much higher cost in, in terms of uh, policy that's just required to do that. So where do we go from here? Uh, as I said, you know, I think, I think the recovery uh, continues uh, through next year. I think the crystal ball gets a little cloudier as we get to the end of the year. Uh, and, and kind of get back into normal what's happening in Washington, D.C., who knows. Um, but the Fed is likely to start changing uh, its, its policy course. That's going to royal markets a bit as they shrink their balance sheet, potentially start raising interest rates. We don't know what kind of spending uh, is going to continue to come out of Washington, D.C. They're still pushing, you know, multi-trillion dollar uh, pieces of legislation, and our national debt is approaching 30 trillion. Uh, right now, which is a debt to GDP ratio of over 130%, which is the highest it's ever been. Um, and that's a concern that nobody really talks about. Um, and, you know, I, uh, Ernest Hemingway, you know, had a dialogue and the sun also rises between two characters. They were talking about one character's uh, bankruptcy and the other character was, you know, hey, Bill, how'd you go bankrupt? And Bill responded, well, two ways, gradually, then suddenly. <laughs> uh, that's sort of how debt prices hit. You know, we're not going to get a 10-year note from the world financial community saying, hey, you know, 30 trillion in debt, maybe you ought to think about this spending loan. Well, no, it's gonna it's gonna sneak up on us. Um, so anyway, uh, Florida, Central Florida, things look great. Uh, you know, we continue to outpace the state economy, we continue to outpace the national economy. Tourism's not fully back yet. Uh, in terms of employment levels, uh, but I think it will certainly get there uh, here in 2022. Leisure travel uh, domestically, I think it's back to the levels it was pre-pandemic. Lagging still is the international uh, visitation. You've got a hodgepodge of different COVID rules and testings and vaccines from different countries and travel restrictions. So that's holding things back. And then the business travel, you know, all those large events at the convention center, those things take you know, a year plus to plan. So when those get canceled, it's not like, oh, I'm going to whip up a consumer electronics expo in two weeks and hold it. There's lags. Uh, so I think that is going to you know, be part of the comeback in leisure hospitality as we move through 2022 as well. Um, with that, I think we've got about 15 minutes left. I'm going to take questions at this point. Let me uh, start off by asking, uh, what about the great uh, resignation. How are those people living? Are they, we're not passing out fourteen hundred dollar checks anymore. Right? No, we're not. Um, but we did do a uh, an increase in the child tax credit for those uh, you know workers that have children, uh, and those those child tax credits, which historically you got when you filed your taxes, are being paid in advance. So there's a stream of income to some families that continues that, that is relatively new. Um, you know, the labor market is a complex thing. You know, if you think about your own life and your decisions about when to enter or exit the labor market at any given point, there's a lot of variables that go into that. So it's, it's you know, there's a thousand stories you could hear about why this person is not in the labor market uh, post-pandemic that they were in there pre-pandemic. Certainly policy is part of that. You know, when you send out multiple $1,400 checks and, and other payments. I mean, my daughter has never filed taxes, works at preschool, daycare kind of thing. I've got a check for $1,000. I'm like, what? Well, I'm a, I'm, it's because I'm a teacher. I'm like, oh, my God. Well, I got spent. You can believe that. But I mean, did she need that $1,000 check? Absolutely not. 
And so the people that were impacted, and you think about the people that are not returning to the labor force, you know, it's not like, ah, oh, geez, you know, all the uh, orthopedic surgeons, they're just not coming back to work. I don't know. <laughs> what, what can we do? What can we do to get them back? No, it's, you know, people working, you know, busing tables uh, or doing prep work in a kitchen or servers or, or housekeeping. Uh, you know, a lot of lower income jobs, many of them part-time, students, for example. You know, if you're a student and you were working at uh, Buffalo Wild Wings washing dishes um, and going to school and then you know, you're getting these checks, you've got a couple of roommates, you're getting these checks, you're getting that extra 300 a week, you're making more money than you did when you were working. Um, so what's the rush? You know, now I've got to pay for gas to drive to, to work to scrub the wing pots. I mean, okay, not a huge incentive there. So I think there's some of that going on. Are there people that are uh, afraid of COVID still? You know, they're concerned about their own personal health, but very possibly. Were there people that had to stay home when schools were shut down and they were teaching their kids and they realized, wow, that's kind of nice to spend time with my children. Maybe we both don't need to work. We don't need to work as much. So I think there's multiple reasons. But again, go back, roll it back pre-pandemic, labor market, close to full employment, 3% unemployment in Florida. There were some worker shortages, certainly, right? Skilled tradespeople in construction, you know, constantly hearing about shortages there. But there wasn't, you know, wide-scale uh, shortages of all workers, right? I, I stopped to get gas at racetrack the other night, then I had to go to the bathroom, right? But I heard up with the pump in the tank and I'm walking up to the door and it's locked. And then I'm like, you know, my mind starts racing. I'm like, are they getting robbed or something? I'm like looking around, you know, looking to see somebody tied up in the back or whatever. And then there was a sign, you know, temporary closed due to worker shortage. And I'm like, wow. You know. So I have three major points regarding the banking system that I think are not talked about and highly alarming. And I just want to ask if there's a backup plan that you could see possible. So the required rank for banking system right now is still 0%. Um, so meaning that they're lending out 100% of the dollars that we give the bank because it's usually 10, they lowered it to 0%. Then we also have the FDIC with essentially no cash on hand because of all the bank failures last year, which is our insurance policy if, we, if our bank closes. The third point is the volume and reverse repo happening on a daily basis in the trillions meaning cash is leaving the bank. What happens if we all want our cash and how, if the FDIC is not there to bail all of our bank accounts out, what is a feasible solution for worst case scenario? Uh, well, a couple of things. One, banks are not loaning out all the money. Uh, banks are sitting on multiple trillions of what we call excess reserves. These are reserves that they're not required to hold uh, and not all reserve requirements are zero. They, you know, uh, but so banks are not just lending the money out. Uh, and that's kind of, this is part of the, the, the financial crisis of 2008, the subsequent passage of the Dodd-Frank uh, financial regulatory reform bill has really changed banking and has changed monetary policy completely. That's made it much more complex going to your third point. That's why there's the use of these reverse repurchase agreements as opposed to the traditional open market operations that that were, you know, how the Fed did policy uh, historically. So the volume of that is just a result of an operating procedure change, okay? The FDIC, you know, it's not like Fort Knox where they just have a bunch of money. So when your bank fails, you just go up there and they, they, they give it, you know, they're, they're, it's backed by the full faith and credit of the United States government, which despite 30 trillion in debt, you know, we still have the, the safest, you know, sovereign bonds in the world, I would argue, certainly by you know, the willingness of people to buy them and certainly uh, bond rating agencies continue to give them the highest grade and, and they're looked at as a, really a default risk free investment. Now, does that mean as some are suggested we can run up as much debt as we want? No, that's, you know, that's kind of foolishness. But uh, I, I think the issues that you're talking about are not as big a problem uh, as they might appear at first glance. It's just a really different landscape in the financial system, how banks do business, and how the Fed conducts monetary policy. Nothing, there's no precedent for that pre 2008. 
just as a little follow up, there's a significant number of policymakers who for the last 30 years have run on the economic policy that debt doesn't matter. Uh, I can think of several highly placed elected officials that have cited that specific phrase. So if it doesn't matter when you're doing tax cuts to throw a few trillion dollars in debt on, why does a couple more trillion in spending matter? Uh, I, I, I don't, uh, I don't uh, make the distinct, I mean, the debt is the debt, whether it's uh, uh, accumulated by spending or by reducing revenues. Um, the problem with the debt, and suppose I use today to announce that I'm running for Senate uh, for the state of Florida, okay? And my, the cornerstone of my platform is that I'm going to address the national debt. And one of the things I'm going to have to do as part of addressing this national debt is to address our entitlement programs that we currently have on the book, Social Security and Medicare. How quickly would, uh, you know, there'd be a Photoshop of me tying my grandmother up and setting her out on the sun rail track. <laughs> <laughs> it would be tweeted out before I got to my car in the parking lot, right? So politicians, there's zero incentive to, to address it because this crisis is beyond the next election. And they don't even do budgeting anymore in the House and Senate, right? It's, it's a series of continuing slide. resolutions. Because, oh my God, when what you happened? Oh, okay. We have the shutdown theater and then we have the debt ceiling uh, theater. And this, these shows are longer running than cats. <laughs> and, uh, every couple of years, get ready. You see the same stories, they just change the dates. Um, but uh, it doesn't matter what's causing it, the debt does matter, uh, and eventually it will. This notion that it doesn't, and there are a few economists that are pushing this, is quite frankly, we, we haven't felt any pain since the 1980s from running high deficits. During the Reagan administration, when this sort of spending launched and has been continued through every administration since, Republican or Democrat, uh, interest rates were being pushed up by tax cuts, high spending on defense. And so those higher interest rates are crowding out private investment. And so that term crowding out is very popular in the 1980s. So if the government's borrowing more, then businesses might not borrow as much because interest rates are too high. And if they don't borrow to expand, that's going to affect growth in the future. You haven't heard any of the word about crowding out since the 1980s. Why? Interest rates have been near historic lows. You want to borrow, it's not high interest rates. And stuff. So that's part of the issue. And people are short sighted. They say, look, we've been doing this for 30 years. You know, Reagan proved deficits don't matter. Well, they don't matter until they do. And we saw Greece in 2010, not pretty, when you get into a debt crisis. The, uh, you mentioned pent up demand, uh, which may or may not be an accurate figure, uh, according to you. But how much does that affect the current stock market? In other words, how, uh, how far do you see or can you forecast the current stock market continue to gain? I mean, you, you talked about the uh, end of the year, uh, possibly uh, this pent up demand lasting, but how long will the stock market last? Well, I can tell you, sir, I knew that. Uh, certainly, we would be traveling around doing this dog and pony show. Um, <laughs> I, I think what you're saying, uh, the financial markets are by their very nature forward looking. So, you know, they know the spending, they know about pent up demand, they know about the fiscal policy that is, is, you know, accelerated this spending. And you're seeing, you know, the stock market's sort of wavering, right? It's not beginning on, the, you know, breaking new highs like it was for the past several years. Uh, and what's affected it, right? So there's that big piece of uncertainty. When are they going to move? How aggressively are they going to move? So if I had to guess, I would say the stock market probably is going to be a bit of a bumpy ride uh, going forward in this sort of, you know, everything goes up nonstop mode we've been in for a couple of years is, is probably coming to an end. Uh, and once that uncertainty about policy starts to get sorted out, it goes back to fundamentals. What's, what's, what's the economy? Doing? I uh, avoided economics in college because I like one armed economist. But you're wildly entertaining. I would have enjoyed being your class. Question. Sound like an A student, sir. <laughs> Sound only. <laughs> 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 
But uh, you mentioned the policy that caused the recession. How would you, in the future, address that? Because there's going to be another pandemic. We're going to have an uh, endemic because of uh, COVID is not going to go away. So how would you address it as a senior policy analyst if you were advising the president? Yeah, I mean, really, there's no precedent uh, in terms of public policy uh, history for what we did, not just in the U.S., but globally in terms of shutting down the economy. I mean, washing your hands, fantastic. I encourage you all to do it frequently. Uh, masks. <laughs> hey, I, I've kept, ever since I've been in higher education, I have a giant thing of Purell on my desk. I mean, college students are just filthy, right? I, I'm always keeping my hands. Uh, mass sure it makes sense. Shutting down the economy, I don't know. I, I mean, I don't know that. And if you look around the world or you look around different states here, the outcomes in terms of deaths, cases, hospitalizations don't seem to reflect any of these policies whatsoever. I mean, Sweden and Europe basically never shut down, they didn't close schools, they didn't wear masks, they had like a 2% mask usage uh, compliance. Germany, on the other hand, Germany, of course. They go hardcore. They shut down hard multiple times, 98% mask compliance. And oh, by the way, in Germany, if you think you're going to wear a fishing gator and call it a mask, uh, you got to wear an N95 mask, something that could actually stop a virus or a particle that small. There's no difference in those two countries. Uh, so hopefully we learn that lesson. But again, Omicron comes out, it's very clear from the get-go, this is not as severe as previous strains. It's not causing the deaths and hospitalizations. It's the first thing they do. They're locking down again. Um, so I, I, I'm not hopeful. My point is, you know, protect those most vulnerable, number one. Uh, and, and you have to go on. I mean, you just have to, once you do that, you have to carry on. You know, the virus doesn't care that we shut down hair salon. Not impressed. I ended up with shoulder length hair as a result of this whole thing. What a My dog, however, was able to be groomed throughout. The <laughs> okay, this is sort of out of order. All right. Do you think that the overly partisan government interference is part of what had to do with this? Because the the party in charge was saying, "Oh." Let's continue their incomes for another six months beyond the lockdown, forgetting that workers are working to make a living. If they're making a living, they're going to sit at home and go fishing and watch television, where the entrepreneurs, the people that own the restaurants, will be on television constantly saying how there's a shortage. Of, why don't they want to come back to work? I do, because the entrepreneurial class, like us, want to work. There's a basic difference, and I don't think government acknowledges that. Well, I mean, I don't think anyone's surprised that a microbe uh, would be politicized. Everything else is, uh, <laughs> I mean, you know, look at that bacteria, well, Democrat. Yeah, you know, I mean, um, <laughs> politics, of course, played a role in all this. Um, you know, we had a presidential election coming up, not, you know, a pretty heated uh, situation. Uh, so, yeah, you know, I, I wonder if the outcome of the 2016 election is different if the response to the pandemic would have been different. Uh, I don't know that. Um, but the response that we did did, I, I, I did, do, we did do, and I think if we, you know, truth ever makes a comeback and through the lens of history, this will be one of the greatest public policy mistakes in this country's history. When you start racking up the costs, and I don't just mean economic costs of shutdown, I'm talking about health costs, people that didn't get mammograms or didn't get uh, other screenings, that didn't get uh, you know, elective services that allow their conditions to worsen the children who suffer. I mean, yeah, okay, my, my brats have laptops and know how to use them. What about the families that couldn't afford a laptop? What about the, the, the children that had autism or other special needs sitting at home in front of a computer? I'm sorry, there's been damage done that's unaccounted for. And for what? Any policy, you've got to measure the, the, the benefits and the costs. And in this case, there's no question the costs outstripped maybe by 20, 30 fold the benefits of these policies. Sean, your last question. Okay. First of all, thank you for being so entertaining. Um, <laughs> what are the, what, are the <laughs> what do you see um, as the solution with China? Because it seems like as our workers demanded everything, 
you know, higher wages, and then we want everything cheaper, then everything is now being manufactured in China. And then I was kind of hoping when people saw the empty shelves, that maybe that would raise the awareness of, hey, we don't produce anything, but I don't hear anything about that. And so, so how do we balance now that everyone is expect is is used to getting twice their earnings from unemployment and paying nothing for everything with the fact that everything's over there do you think that we have a way to get manufacturing back here even for the things that are national security risks like pharmaceuticals like we don't we are consuming them like crazy and we don't produce them so what's the solution i i, I think the possibility of some manufacturing returning domestically we're already seeing um uh plans for uh, microchip uh, production expansion. Uh, I think in Austin, there's a, a, a huge plant. I don't know if it's Intel or who's doing it, but, but a mass expansion there. You know, some pharmaceuticals, that makes sense as well. You know, I think businesses, um, if they didn't know it beforehand, certainly know now that diversifying their supply chain makes sense. Uh, will low value manufacturing that has left this country come back to this country? No. Um, will it always be in China? No. Even before the pandemic, a lot of that lower end, lower cost stuff was moving to uh, Malaysia, Vietnam, which is where wages were even lower. Uh, you know, China, you know, China, in my mind, is a greater risk than the Soviet Union ever was. Uh, and it's not because they're going to invade us, uh, per se, but um, they Soviet Union embraced Marxism from top to bottom, from the totalitarian governance of, of the Soviet Union to the economic philosophy by which they allocated their scarce resources and for which Marxism is a complete not a failure. China embraced, at least in part, markets. And so they've got way more money than the Soviet Union ever did. And they're using that money, the uh, Belt and Road or whatever that initiative is, they're investing around the globe and in countries and areas where there's strategic resources. Um, you know, it, it, it's a concern. But in the end, um, you know, people are going to buy the cheap thing. You know, we've tried Buy American and maybe it works for a little while, but uh, you know, there has to be a concerted uh, effort, I think, on government for things that are of strategic security. Instances and and you know, chia pets are not that, uh, so they can continue to be made in China wherever the hell they come from. John, thank you. Uh, we're stay. we're out of time, but I really want to thank you. I hope all of you will agree this has been one of our incredibly best programs, and we're so fortunate to have Sean in this community. Thank you, Sean. Thank you.